Welcome uh, to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, this is the first uh, Medicine Grand Rounds of the year. Um, it's a very exciting topic, climate change and human health. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jay Lemery uh, from uh, the Department of Emergency Medicine uh, as our presenter. Uh, Dr. Lemery is a professor of medicine. He's the chief of the section of Wilderness and Environmental Medicine received his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, his MD degree from Dartmouth, and he did his residency at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. He stayed on at Cornell Medical Center for um, a, fa a faculty appointment as an assistant professor, and then we were fortunate to recruit him here in 2014 uh, to head up the uh, section on wilderness uh, and environmental medicine. Uh, Dr. Lemery has served as a consultant uh, to the Centers for Disease Control, the Environmental Protection Agency, and NASA, and he is a participant on the round table at the National Academy of Medicine in Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Lemery has focused his career on climate change, especially in vulnerable populations, and on educational approaches uh, to wilderness medicine. So it's a pleasure to have him today, and I really look forward to his comments on climate change and human health. I want to remind the audience that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we will um, um, uh, collate these questions, and I'll act as the moderator at the end of the discussion and we'll uh, work with uh, Dr. Lemery to, um, to address all the questions that, that you ask. So, um, Dr. Lemery, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. It's a real honor to be here. Um, today, we're gonna take a little, many, uh, little sparks of interest. We're gonna go start with a case. We're gonna talk about Climate Science 101. Talk about science communication and the effects uh, on uh, the, the, in the, climate change and health effect, the health effects of climate change. We'll talk about what we're doing here and beyond and how you, you may be involved, our institution may be involved, and then some conclusions. So I'll start with a case. Um, September 2017, a category five hurricane, maximum sustained winds 175 miles an hour, headed towards Puerto Rico. <clears throat> the damage was considerable. Uh, home to 3.1 million Americans, it was the worst natural disaster to affect the island, the 10th most intense Atlantic hurricane on record. You can see here, power lines were down for months, incredible structural damage, food and water security issues, and uh, communities were isolated and cut off. The Institute of Forensic Sciences, which is the medical examiner, later that fall reported the deaths from this hurricane at 64. <clears throat> this caused a lot of consternation and um, was very concerning for those involved to say, hmm, is there something else going on here? Um, does this really reflect the actual death toll from such a dramatic uh, event? So I just want to say earlier that year, uh, concomitantly, we started a Climate and Health Science Policy Fellowship at CU, which is really designed to bring physicians to the forefront of this and we're the first one in the nation. You can see here some of the competencies, but it was really to build leaders in climate and health science. So that had started um, a few months prior to this hurricane. Supported by the Living Closer Foundation, a Denver-based nonprofit, we worked with the Global, Re the Global Change Research Program at the US government, the CDC and the NIHS, really to get our fellows and our, our physicians into the room and. Um, be where they need to be to really understand and be part of that policy. So around this time, people uh, began to ping each other through back channel networks and say, hey, we really can't um, get our hands around this death toll that happened in Puerto Rico. We want to put together a team that could perhaps go there and maybe do some assessment and figure out what the real excess mortality was. Because in the end, it was very important to understand this extreme weather event and the effects thereof. So we put together a team from the fellowship here at CU, friends at the Harvard School of Public Health and Carlos Albizu University in Puerto Rico. And we were boots on the ground, uh, did uh, house to house surveys you know, in, in communities and really tried to uh, do best practice research methodology to understand what that excess mortality was. <clears throat> we knew this would be a hot topic 
and in some ways a lightning rod. And we were fortunate enough to get our results in the New England Journal the following spring. We couldn't do as many surveys as we'd like, so the bell curve was wide, it was about 800 to 8,000, but that mean was 4645. And that's a number um, that really became a lightning rod, um, as you're gonna see in a second. Sherry Fink from the New York Times broke the news the Tuesday after Memorial Day. So again, this was the following spring. It made the front page of the New York Times. The Washington Post put it on the front page. Look here, you can see the, the toll with the, already the data is being skewed in the headlines. Research uh, toll tops 4,600. So again, that bell curve wasn't necessarily represented. And then crazy happened. Um, as is the case, it, to, which is happening today. So um, at first we heard from Elizabeth Warren, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi on the left, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, CIA Director Gina Haspel on the right. And then there were protests in New York and San Juan and the mayor of San Juan actually printed out and handed out hats that said 4645. So this thing really took on a life of its own. And then of course, by the perverse metric, <clears throat> of uh, notoriety of this day and age, there was a presidential tweet about this. Here's where we had hoped things would end up, and in fact they did, which was in the end, there was transparency and Puerto Rico was ordered to release these death records. To us, this was proof of concept, like, okay, finally we are able to uh, shine a flashlight on this, and the fact that we're spending time investing in climate and health issues really is paying off. Like, here's a place where we were able to put human power and resources to really bring this uh, data to the forefront. So it was exciting in some regards, a proof of concept. Um, notoriety began to follow. The Wall Street Journal said, hey, we noticed that medical schools are getting more into this. You know, what do you think? They interviewed us. We actually had uh, finished this article with the University of Colorado now offers a fellowship uh, with physicians on climate and health policy. Super exciting. Uh, very, you know, awesome. We were proud of our accolades, maybe even a bit smug that we were onto something. It felt good. Um, but then something happened that became illustrative of a bit of a pushback. This is a very inflammatory article or op-ed that happened after the fact by a dean, Dean Goldfarb at Penn, which basically say, you know, this, uh, this take two aspirin and call me by my pronouns. If the country needs more gun control and climate change activists, medical schools are not the right place to produce them. Um, the, op the Wall Street Journal board followed with uh, a, a bravo saying, patients want an accurate diagnosis, not a lecture on social justice or climate change, and uh, labeled this social media uh, movement, which many of us are involved with, is left-wing medical Twitter. Yes, there is such a thing. So um, clearly, formidable challenges on the horizon. And I sort of conclude this case with a rhetorical uh, um, assessment and plan to you as, you know, what, what now, to what degree do we keep pushing this rock up the, up the hill? Um, so I'll leave it there, and we're going to keep moving. What I want to do now is just give you a little bit of overview on climate and health and science. I think <clears throat> it's super important just to have a bit of a 101 on this, because if you don't quite get it, none of this else makes sense. So we're going to go fast. Um, and again, it's just a, we're going to talk about the physical science basis and then move on to the health effects. When I give lectures and interviews, I pull this up. This is a chart from the CDC, because there's just so much going on. It's impossible to pull it all at once. And if you look at that inner circle, it's really the drivers. Um, and you could say there are three or four, it doesn't really matter, but rising, te rising temperatures, extreme weather, sea level rise, increased CO2. That next concentric circle is the um, environmental impacts, and then the rectangle is the health effects that follow. So it, it, it's, an it's an elegant representation. It's maybe a little bit of a clunky slide, but uh, to me, it kind of puts it all in one place. So I refer to it off often, it's from the CDC. So let's dive into the physical science basis. Um, I invoke the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's where a lot of the best data lives. Of course, it's peer-reviewed. A lot of peer-reviewed doesn't get in it because of the intense scrutiny. Um, but let's just be clear. No one who really understands the science is debating whether this is human-caused anymore. Um, 
it's lunchtime, so I know some of the residents are probably snacking and you want to tune out for this part because you're a little postprandial, that's fine. Just trying to make sure my hand correlates with the graph. I think it does. You're going to see a lot of this. Um, so here's atmospheric CO2. The squiggles are just the differences between summer and winter with a boreal forest blooming in the summer, and then there isn't as much biomass in the southern hemisphere. So that's where the zigzags come. But the trend is pretty clear. The science is actually awesome. Um, it comes from ice cores, where ice cores are drilled down deep. And when snow falls on snow over eons and millennia, that air gets trapped, gets trapped in the ice. And in, scientists can actually sample the air of and the atmosphere that existed um, millennia ago. So that's pretty cool. Um, and actually, fun fact, it actually lives in Denver. I thought, I always said, made the joke that said, you know, like anything else in Denver, you can get it on Colfax. And one of the students said, you know, that's actually not Colfax, which I guess it isn't, but it is in Lakewood. Um, and it's the National Ice Core Laboratory where we went out and did a tour and saw the uh, ice in action. And it was great. You know, at first it was, you, know, you saw ice and then I, I kind of thought you get out there and it would be like ice. Awesome. Where's the gift shop? Um, but the truth was, it was a fabulous tour. There are outstanding educators there. And the data that they shared is pretty clear. And you can see here, you know, this is where we begin to think about um, how to counteract that commentary. Well, this has been going on for eon. We don't really know, do we? Actually, we do really know. And here it is, that there have been fluctuations in carbon dioxide up to 800,000. And really now the data is going back 1.2 million years. And you can see here, there's an asymptotic change during the last 100 years, 150 years from the Industrial Revolution. So uh, we know something drastic is happening. The top 10 warmest years have all been since 2005, and 2020 is on track uh, to be the warmest ever. We're losing our cryosphere, right? The frozen parts of the planet, which is really impactful for all sorts of processes, but mostly sea level rise, right? It's, this is, this is you know, seventh grade earth science, you melt an ice cube, you can predict how much more the little beaker is going to fill up with water, right? So we're losing the thickness, the extent of, uh, of, our, um, of our polar caps, so the, the Arctic and the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheet. And here's just another representation of the mac record low maximum, right? So the end of the winter, it's supposed to be the biggest. We're seeing, we're seeing decreases there. We're seeing the size of the ice sheet is much lower. Um, and uh, again, that, what that means in terms of uh, sea level rise, sorry, here, is that you can see there's many different representations because the science is trying to, again, you guys understand this bracket. Uh, they use these things called representative concentration pathways, RCPs. 2.6 is the, the least amount of change. 8.5 is, is, again, these are conventions for the greatest amount of change. And then obviously somewhere in between is where most, most people think the changes are going to be. Here's just another representation to 2060 of American cities. So very impactful. And remember, it's not just underwater. It's a uh, storm surge. It's, um, uh, you know, wind and wind threats. So this is, this is a coastline that's uh, going to be under much more stress. And for coastal cities throughout the world, it's, it's truly going to be an existential issue. And here's, again, just another representation of that, what's going to happen worldwide as these ice caps slowly melt and end up in the ocean. Oceans are changing in other ways too, right? So we're seeing pH uh, changes, not just from um, ice caps and um, issues with, with biomass, but actually most carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are in the, that, that is being sequestered by the greenhouse gases are being uh, sequestered in the oceans. So you, can, you know you take a closed system and you start pumping in carbon dioxide, right? This is blood gas 101. Um, we're seeing a change in pH. This has huge implications for the coral reefs and the bleaching of the coral reefs, which isn't just sort of biodiversity, but also the bottom of the food chain, right? So this has huge impacts for, um, there's another slide coming up talking about the um, dependence that uh, the world population has on um, fish protein, right? So food security issue as that bio, uh, the, the bottom of the food chain gets disrupted um, our, our protein supplies and then food security is under, uh, undermined. Changes in the global water cycle won't be uniform, right? So wet places, wetter, dry places, drier. This is one of those key points I really want you to walk away from because the earth is not just a simple lump of clay where if you're 
have a warmer, where it's not going to be a warmer lump of clay from a greenhouse effect, right? So you, you have these, these uh, headlines saying, you know, the, the winter's been bad here, it's, or the, 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 there's a cold weather snap here, a cold weather snap there. You know, how can there be climate change? How can there be planetary warming, right? Snowballs on the floor of the Senate when Boston had the worst, the, I think it was the fourth snowiest winter, you know, a few years ago. Like, how can there be climate change? So this is really a challenge to communicate this because it's not just warmer. Um, it's a complex system that we're adding energy into, right? So it's not a warmer system. It's a more energetic, unpredictable system. So people lament the fact that we actually came up with global warming, you know, years ago. They should have, no, we shouldn't have said that. We should have said global energizing. But then our communication specialists say, no, 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 don't use energizing. It's way too optimistic. So Catherine Hayhoe coined the phrase, and she's out of Texas Tech, global weirding, which I think really sort of reflects the true nature of what we're talking about. If this is still hard to understand, which I'm sure you do, but uh, it's hard to explain, I go back to an analogy I made a couple of years ago with my then three-year-old, which said, let's take a complex system and add energy to it. So we added concentrated colored sugar. Now let's just see what happens. Because you know, the simple thing would be a more energetic child. So at first we had a more energetic child, then super physiologic feats of strength. But then something strange happened, paradoxical hypersomnolence with erratic behavior well beyond two standard deviations, right? So this is a cute, fun little example that just goes to say that climate change is crazy town. And if you're trying to explain this to somebody, explain a toddler that had too much sugar. Right? They go bonkers and off the wall, a complex system with, with energy added to it. Okay, <clears throat> we're moving fast, but I want to um, now move into health effects because I think um, this is really important. And I like this slide because it really illustrates the take-home message here, which is one of vulnerability. Uh, climate change is a disease of vulnerability, and I want to leave you with that in this lecture. And this is a, uh, a picture, I think, that sort of embodies that. So, again, the report from the IPCC, up until mid-century, uh, climate change is a threat multiplier. It's going to take existing health problems and make them worse. It's going to exacerbate them. Um, but as these uh, effects uh, continue to grow in the 21st century, as we keep moving forward, they'll be primary drivers of ill health in and of themselves, especially in vulnerable places with low income and, and poor governance in developing countries. Uh, here we see the hot weather curve, right? So the old weather, your, wherever you are, your historic weather pattern is the taller bell curve. Now that bell curve is moving to the warmer and getting wider to, uh, to account for more erratic um, weather, which, uh, and I'm not sure you can see, I don't think I have a pointer, but if you look at that tail on the right, extreme hot weather is well beyond historical precedence. Um, and that's really what's keeping people nervous because you'll have what happened in 03 in Europe, which is a resource rich place where um, temperatures for a week were well beyond historic norms. No one knew in Paris to go upstairs and check on your fifth floor walk up old neighbor, uh, make sure they had an air conditioning because oh, by the way, they never needed it before. The public health systems were caught off guard. There were no cooling shelters. And uh, you can see here, there was a tremendous amount of uh, morbidity and mortality from that. Um, not to say that climate change caused this heat wave, but this heat wave, again, is illustrative of those aberrancies that we're going to be seeing, which will, um, will be well beyond historical experience. And we know heat is just a brutal um, threat multiplier for chronic disease, right? Um, it's, this is hard to research. We know when we write our, in Epic, you know, and someone comes in within, you know, the last couple of weeks, they, we don't admit them for smoky weather or really hot outside. We admit them for CHF exacerbation, um, you know, diabetes exacerbation, uh, chest pain, right? Things like that. But you can see here, heat is a completely, um, uh, it, it's a formidable impact on um, those with chronic disease, increasing the death rate with every, for every one degree Celsius in extreme heat, you know, 4% with diabetes, 3.8 with heart attack, 3.7 with chronic lung disease. So this is really, um, impressive data. Cities themselves are risk factors. So there's something called the urban heat island effect. Um, and again, in vulnerable communities without access to parkland covered with pavement, uh, it doesn't, they don't cool off at night and they retain heat 
um, seven to 12 degrees compared to the surrounding areas with parkland and um, uh, open green space. So again, um, a, a, a threat as more and more people are living in cities, but it's not an even threat, right? It's like this, there's a disproportionate amount on the most, on most vulnerable. We've seen this in rural settings worldwide too. So Rick Johnson, who I'm gonna give a shout out to later is the former chief of nephrology. Um, one of my mentors uh, did some seminal work looking at climate change and extreme heat events in field workers in Central America, trying to sort out this disease called Mesoamerican nephropathy, where people are, uh, field workers are uh, boxing their kidneys uh, way too early in life, in the 30s and 40s. And it's uh, multifactorial. A lot of it has to do with access to clean water, but very much correlated with extreme heat events. We've seen the same thing with colleagues uh, in their work in Sri Lanka. So again, these vulnerable field workers suffering from extreme heat events. Energized weather is causing more extreme precipitation events across the United States. And, um, you know, with the bedrock of public health, we eat here, we grow our food here, we go to the bathroom here, and they sure, they for shall ever remain separate. We know extreme uh, precipitation events creates a, a big blender, mixes them up, uh, undermines food, uh, excuse me, water security and food security. And, uh, you know, a big place with tenuous public health uh, infrastructure, you know, um, diarrhea is still the leading cause of, uh, one of the leading causes of death worldwide in under five-year-old, right? So a huge burden of disease that's gonna be pressed made worse. Um, and even in New York City, which is a resource rich area, um, we didn't drink the water after an extreme downpour for 10 or 15 minutes because we knew, we were told that the pumps were overwhelmed and there was a chance of contamination. When all that water washes downstream into warmer bodies of water, um, you know, there's a cofactor of increased nutrients, which is a little different than climate change, but moving into, um, uh, warm water where algae exist, you know, in the concentrations, they're completely harmless to humans. But then when they confronted with warm water and abundant food, they logarithmically proliferate, ca causing harmful algal blooms. Um, and we're seeing more of those in uh, less, less of a tropical, subtropical disease in more in temperate waters. And, you know, some of the diseases here are, are, are uh, you know, stroke-like syndromes, amnestic shellfish poisoning, um, so neurotoxins, hepatotoxins, and then respiratory toxins as well. I mean, this past week, we, we know wildfires are longer in duration and more intense, um, so destroying forests in the uh, places where people live, and then, of course, here, right, air quality degraded throughout the West. Um, which is an inconvenience for the young and healthy, but for those with COPD, asthma, uh, pregnant, you know, these become more, um, more, uh, in more uh, considerable risk factors. Mosquitoes and vector-borne diseases are existing in places of higher altitude and higher latitude. So this is a um, um, concerning, particularly for places with historically naive populations. In the East African highlands or the US Southeast, where they haven't ever had to deal with this, so they don't have the uh, whatever immunity may exist, and certainly the infrastructure of screens and so forth to deal with it. So again, uh, the world is becoming more tropical in, in, in disease patterns. And then with um, this hypercharged weather systems, we're seeing more disasters caused by weather and climate. And this is the source is Munich RE, the insurance company for insurance companies. They were early on, they didn't care too much about politics on this one because their job is to go to insurance companies and say, we're going to charge you more money and here's the data to tell you why. And so they've been really early movers in sort of articulating the data of climate change, um, the, the reinsurance companies. And uh, we saw this with the largest recorded storm in history. By the time it hit the uh, Northeast, it was no longer a hurricane, it was just a big blob of water and it dumped um, in the resource rich Northeast and including New York City where the you know, people lost their lives and there was lots of damage. This was all over the news. But this is where I trained. This is Bellevue and Tisch. Bellevue is the hospital for the immigrants, the indig indigenous, the prisoners in New York City. Uh, there's no locks on the doors as far as I could tell. It was open since the 1730s, right? And Bellevue and Tisch despite their best efforts, were both knocked out by storm surge coming up from the East River and various parts of the hospitals were offline nine months to a year. <clears throat> and the thing 
that we haven't really accounted for is what was the echo effect of that vulnerable population from the safety net hospital of New York City no longer being able to achieve care, um, get their regular care, get their regular meds, disruption, and so forth. Um, we know there's lots of hospitals in New York, but I worked at those too, and we know emergency care. The emergency room is just not a substitute for your refill of your hypertensive and diabetic care and medicines and so forth, right? So um, a huge uh, echo effect there of the most vulnerable in the most research rich city in the world. So I think this is a very powerful example of um, vulnerability or maybe we weren't able to necessarily see that in the headlines. And this guy is, is our nemesis. He's a Greenlandic farmer. They're killing it up there. They're growing stuff they've never grown before. They're having bumper crops. And, you know, there's a commentary out there that says, hey, well, there's warmer agriculture is going to boom. It's going to be great for us. Well, sort of. Um, I guess if you live in the Canadian Plains or Russia, there might be some warmer weather. There's not more sunlight, which is an important factor. But again, think about vulnerability in all those red and orange areas of the world where, um, you know, their net, pro their net agricultural productivity is going to drop right? And the global net is going to drop. So huge implications for food insecurity, which, uh, you know, has downstream effects with, with malnutrition and displacement and, um, um, and chronic illness. And then again, as promised, here's another slide from a report on the cryosphere that came out um, where net uh, simulated seafood production is down as well across the world. And, you know, a, a quarter of the population of the world, um, depends on uh, tw uh, protein at 20% from their seafood, right? So huge amounts of protein needed to, uh, in very vulnerable places, the, the coastal areas of the planet. <clears throat> All these things are going to cause people to not be able to thrive where they are. Um, so they're going to have to move and uh, mitigate um, and, and ad adapt to these new changing conditions. In wilderness medicine, we always love to talk about um, bagging a peak, you know, go someplace and bag a peak. Um, I want to go to the Maldives because I just have to stand on this chair and I'll be at the highest point in the Maldives and bag the peak there. But the point is, is that in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, there are um, millions of, of people that are going to be uh, underwater in, in, in centuries because of sea level rise. This is just simple math. Um, they're already starting resettlement communities in Australia and New Zealand. But, you know, if anyone who's ever studied forced migration or migration due to external pressures, Right. This is not a this is not a recipe for good health. Uh, people disrupted from their friends and family and historic ties and healthcare and, and all that. Um, and there's evidence to say that uh, places with poor governance, um, uh, poverty, and economic shocks will be amplified. Um, and there's there's a great publication that came out a few years ago, saying that the Levant, which is uh, Syria and Lebanon, has suffered had suffered from the worst drought in over 900 years, and this was thought to be a cofactor in uh, Syrian farmers leaving their desiccated farmlands, moving into the cities, you know, already a tinderbox and adding to this, um, to the, uh, the, the strife that was the Syrian civil war. You know, a very sober quote from Kirk Smith over at Berkeley, um, which again, uh, ex talks about how the poor are gonna be the most vulnerable in all this. So let's transition. So what are, what are we doing with this? Well, <clears throat> Um, I think the first thing that people are doing that this was one of my awakening moments years ago in healthcare was to say, we have the power to use the goodwill that we have in, in healthcare, using that power of science communication. We tell our patients, hey, you need that medicine, you need that surgery. They generally say, okay, doc, yeah, okay, sounds good. You know, second opinions notwithstanding. We still hold the public trust. And through that, we have a chance to really reframe and get away from polar bears on icebergs and move it to kids with inhalers and get away from abstractions, you know, save the whales, love mother earth or, um, or altruism rather. And then the abstractions of, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide. You guys may know what that means. Most people have no clue when we're like, Oh my God, we're hitting the high, the high for, you know, 17, 4, 18, right. It means nothing. Um, to most people. So get away from that messaging and start talking about our parents' risk of chronic lung disease worsening and kids' risk of asthma. I, I pause here to put in what I frame Ed Maybach as a, as a 
um, climate change communicator. He works out of George Mason. He's not a, not a healthcare provider, but I, I, I was so impressed. I named it my box pentad. Um, I thought this would go viral on Twitter. I think two people retweeted me. So hopefully today it's going to go viral. Um, but he gives a very elegant um, evidence-based, so it's based in communication research, way to, to talk about climate and health science communication. It's real, it's really happening, it's us, it's human caused. Experts agree here, pick your constituency and pop in your experts, who will those people trust? It's bad, but there's hope. There's lots of things that are happening that can give us hope. And that's sort of the uh, simple messaging that he uh, advocates for promulgation. <clears throat> So what are we doing with this here at CU? Well, um, I'll just take you sort of a little bit of our mini history. I came here in 2012 thinking, okay, what would a curriculum look like? How do we teach this? And then like any good academician, someone said, hey, you know, if you're thinking about this, you should, you should just put the textbook together. So I got together with a colleague at the CDC and we put together the a textbook. It was one of the first on climate and health. And uh, like any good lecture, I'm going to uh, push my next edition coming out this November. Um, and it really represents, there's, tr there's a tremendous amount of people involved and many authors um, from, from our campus as well. So the textbook came out and that was really our foundation to teach this. And then the students were like, oh my God, I read your book. Which was somewhat disheartening because you know they're lying. No one can read a textbook um, like this. And... Um, we knew we had to do better. So I went back and talked to my mentor at Stanford and we came up with this word we made up called Envirometics. And it's a book and it really brings forth uh, health vignettes, composite vignettes to really uh, bring it to the public. So it's a great read for anyone on this, uh, watching this to get a quick inventory. But it's really written to kind of bring forth, uh, bring the reader to the bedside, be like, this is sickness. We know sickness and this is what it's like to look at an 11 year old who's breaking through their inhalers that needs help because the air quality is so bad for so much longer because it's so much hotter outside. In 2016, the Dean uh, put forth a, um, uh, a large grant opportunity for the faculty and then uh, three internists who are just giants in the field um, were happy enough to loop me into it. Lee Newman, Rick Johnson and Rosemary Rocheford and uh, we came together and uh, said we went in for the grant. We were ultimately unsuccessful, but I think the purpose was it brought us all together, got us all talking. We looped in environmental scientists from Boulder and started a consortium to think about climate and health issues uh, and you know, to focus on innovation, advocacy, and leadership. And then um, along the way, we started a, uh, collaborating with the School of Public Health and Dean Samet um, underwrote uh, some symposia um, a few different ones with uh, Boulder and Colorado public health leaders and really gave our consortium a way to keep uh, further interacting and thinking about this in a multi-collaborative and a multidisciplinary way. And then the fellowship has moved forward and now we're working with the Nature Conservancy, the work, looking at ICU admissions and, and uh, air quality with National Jewish, working with the NIHS and NREL. Um, and then um, you know, starting our first student elective at the School of Medicine, we're going to have another one this year, doing innovative things like lectures uh, from all the, um, all the people that are in our textbook, but also doing op-ed workshops, bringing them to Rocky Mountain National Park and doing some hands-on learning with environmentalists. And then uh, throwing it out to the, uh, to the non-EM folks listening, um, we realized it started off in emergency medicine only as a way to, to, to start it, but really this fellowship ought to be um, more broad than that. So we're actively exploring ways to have a non-emergency fellows um, because working clinically is really not the most important thing. It's thinking about all these other things. So uh, please do ping me um, offline on that one if you're interested. I'm happy to talk to you more about that. And then finally this past year, um, uh, the Dean uh, finally um, thought it was a great idea to underwrite a climate and health program. And uh, He's uh, tasked Rosemary Rocheford and myself with starting it. So we're, we're very uh, pleased and honored to be able to, to do this. Um, we're looking for players. So please, again, if you're interested um, in moving any of these things forward, a lot of it's education-based, community lecture series, CMEs. Um, we're doing our, elect our elective at the School of Medicine. Again, it's going to be a, a virtual elective. Um, and then... Um, just thinking about how to move forward uh, the campus and give us that first mover advantage for all the great work that people have been doing on this. I put an asterisk, we have 
aspirationally, we wanted to start a carbon offset program. Um, we had a meeting uh, at the beginning of March on this with some of the principals at the School of Medicine. They were very excited about it. And then, of course, the next week, the campus closed. So we're hopeful that we'll be able to. That's a complicated one. I don't think we've had that one solved, but that's an aspiration that we'd like to deliver. Um, so nationally, a lot of activity on this. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility are very active in greening of healthcare. They have actually a conference called Clean Med, which brings together not just care providers, but hospital, physical plant people and administrators to think about you know, how 20% of our GDP, which healthcare contributes to, can reduce their carbon footprint. The National Academies are making a huge um, push this year, so keep an eye on that. And the Medical Society is a con Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health is a group that brings together different medical societies. Um, the American College of Physicians is a big leader there to think about how we can all interact, um, and that's based out of George Mason. And then Columbia is putting together a, uh, a global consensus from many stakeholders on what is a what does what does a core competency look like, and then you know for med schools and for nursing and public health. Um, I put this here because we're, we're writing a big perspective for uh, health affairs um, and it's in, in peer review, but we're looking at um, what does a comprehensive public health agenda look like? So um, as we think about that, you know, we think about the campus, you know, dedicated curricula, training programs, interdisciplinary research, um, advocacy and outreach, dedicated support, and then integration with global health equity, social justice and diversity inclusion initiatives. So. These are all marks of what a uh, what engagement could look like on campus. In clinical practice, um, health society engagement. What is your society doing? How are you um, seeing this topic show up in, in CME, dedicated or standalone lectures? Policy statements, peer re you know, space in peer reviewed journals, uh, social media, greening infrastructure projects. And then when we think about our, our um, hospital systems, um, is there a renewable energy plan? Are there identifiable sustainability champions? Are there reporting of meaningful metrics in this area? And then beyond that, carbon offset programs for the incredible amount of travel we do as, a, as faculty. And then uh, even thinking about divestment portfolios and oil and gas portfolios and car car carbon energy. <clears throat> I'm pleased to report for those that don't know, uh, ACP has been a long leader in this. Um, really ahead of the game by most medical societies, and they have a position paper as of 2016 on climate and on, in health, and an awesome toolkit website where a lot of the things in that long list I just went over are show up. So um, please take a look at that if you're interested. And then finally, I just threw this in because it, it, how do we talk about this without talking about COVID? There's less data here, but there are emerging narratives. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, uh, you know, similar things, a lack of preparation and coordination, um, economic consequences and disproportionate burden, um, you know, a trashing of the commons, if you will, are all part of this um, approach to, you know, our similarity between climate change and what we've seen with COVID. But then we've also seen a historic mobilization of resources, stimulus packages, accelerated product development. So we can mobilize the resourcing and the will when we need to, um, a historic opportunity. Um, you know, a lot of this now conversation is now deeply rooted in environmental justice issues. So just pay attention to this. This is where a lot of these things are gonna be um, coming from. And uh, you know, the aspiration here is can we advance human capital potential and human dignity in the same effort? So wrapping this up, how do we frame this health threat? So we talked about it's a disease of infections, respiratory distress, food insecurity, waterborne illness, heat stress, mental illness, displacement and trauma. But as we think about what happened in Puerto Rico at the beginning of this lecture, Houston before and now happening again, uh, we'll see what, hopefully everyone will be okay, but there's a hurricane now hitting Houston. And then of course, California, um, I'll just reiterate, it's a disease of vulnerability and disasters. This is all about changing our collective risk assessment in terms of being able to provide a health angle on energy policy, the importance of clean air, uh, biodiversity, 
water access and the uh, understanding the ravages of extreme weather events. Because the truth is life, planet Earth, Mother Earth is going to be fine, right? This life was thriving when there was 860 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's the homo sapiens that are at risk. So I'll conclude by taking us to that cave in southern France. Um, 30,000 years ago, these amazing cave dwellings showed up. And then there was this. And Werner Herzog gave a documentary and he said, what were they thinking? What, what, what did they mean? And to me, it was as clear as day. It's the same thing my kid does every time there's a mud puddle. They put their hand in it. It was almost as if they were giving us a high five through time, saying, hey, we're here. We're here. We're going to do great things. And we have done great things. We've put people on other planets, made incredible strides in health and wellness, cracked the secrets of the atom, gotten rid of horrible diseases, and made great strides in human rights. How will we be remembered, though? Will we be the denizens of the great procrastination, where we had everything in front of us but did nothing? Or can we, too, give a like-minded uh, like high-five through time and in turn, our progeny looks at us and said, that was a generation who is emblematic of the best attributes of the human spirit. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for having me. Jay, thanks very much. That was really fantastic. Um, uh, there are a lot of questions that have come in uh, to the Q&A box. I want to uh, encourage people to continue to submit questions. Let me start with the first. Um, how can um, some of our trainees and young faculty get involved in your program? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's the fellowship, which is obviously a huge bite of the sandwich, um, uh, and we're reinventing that. But I think this, um, the new climate and health program at the School of Medicine was meant to be fully inclusive. Um, and, you know, we had, we had proposed a big footprint, much of it in-person activity, which of course is curtailed now, but we're going to do the same thing online and we need a lot of players to help. Um, so I, I think under those auspices, I would say, uh, give Dr. Uh, Rosemary Rochefort or myself a, a, a call um, or an email um, because we have, a, a, we have a big mandate to disseminate and there's many ways to do it, whether it's through um, you know, lectures or seminars or teaching med students, uh, putting up CMEs, or even, um, you know, residency um, educational initiatives. Uh, we need help with all those things. And um, we were just green lit uh, literally a month ago. So it, it, it's new and it's raw and it gives everyone a chance to be in at the bottom floor and just help, help, think this, help us think this through. Yeah, that's great. Um, so folks that want to get involved should just get in touch with you or Rosemary. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, one of the disconnects for, for the clinician out there is how does the clinician bring this to the bedside? Not just treating a patient with a disease that may be exacerbated by the environment, but actually preempting that and specifically understanding the environmental attributes of that disease. Um, and potentially preventing that disease from progressing in that individual because of the environmental attributes? I think that's a great question. We, we've often talked about that, and there's, there's active conversations about to what degree do you bring this to the patient? I think it can be a clumsy interaction if we just have a blanket. And, you know, talk, you talk to them about smoking, healthy living, is there a gun in the house, and climate change, right? It, to me, that feels disingenuous, and I'm not sure that's the right thing. I think it begins with un really just having the clinician understand the stressors. Um, and you know, this week is a perfect week to talk about that because the air quality is horrible. Um, there's a real climate driver behind it. And there's a chance for that interaction to say, hey, take it easy this week. You have COPD, you're on two liters oxygen, whatever it may be. Um, and then if there's a chance to discuss that, then talk about it. If it feels like it's the right pa doctor-patient interaction, yes. But don't, you know, I don't think you have to force it. The other thing is that there's many constituents that, the, that a physician has, right? You have friends, you have your family. We know that most of our friends and family, I tell the students this, you know, we know different, but everyone else thinks they're the smartest people in their lives, right? Um, so, I mean, that's an opportunity for them, you know, whether they're having beers socially or whatever, um, uh, or, or even, you know, in their own, um, their own area of interest, if they're up on the podium, there's always room for this. 
um, you know, it's, it's the, in some ways it's becoming the elephant in the room. Um, and, and I think it's important to contextualize that within their own work. It, it doesn't take much and it uh, often makes you seem a little bit more connected to what's going on in the world um, and help the patient in turn make those connections. So um, yeah, I think, I, as I said, I think there's many ways to do it. And I think it starts with just the clinician feeling confident. They understand that one of the things we got from our students early on was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm going to be a urologist. Like what, what right do I have to talk about this? And our response was, you know, you're, you're a physician first and foremost. And you know, that was, that was how we emphasized that. So tell us a little bit more about how to talk about this um, because um, this is a highly charged topic yeah. with lots of opinions uh, and, um, and, and lots of facts. Um, but um, oftentimes the opinions and the political persuasions uh, dominate the conversation and the facts get lost. Yeah. Great. They're, they're, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on cl um, communication scientists who have actually preceded our work. Um, if someone can maybe pull this on the on, and share it with a group, it's a group called Eco America, and they have a subsidiary called Climate for Health, and it's how to talk health and climate, I think, and it's the doctor's guide uh, or healthcare provider's guide, and it's um, it, it, we actually teach this in our course. It's a, uh, it's 16 steps um, to think about in crafting a narrative of how you talk about this. And it's, um, what I like about it is it's, it start, it's, it's communication science and, it, and it's sharing a story and conceding um, some level of, yeah, you know, I'm not quite sure, but at the same point, you don't wanna misrepresent that there isn't hard science out there. And, um, but it's a PDF that's available and it's, it's wonderful and we teach that um, when we have our students write op-eds and we don't tell them what to write. Um, you know, we're, we are, you know, it's hard not to be political, but it really, that that's our power is from being apolitical, being a healthcare provider. So we have to be very careful not to exceed that mandate. I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm getting crankier. So I'm not sure I succeeded today, but we definitely teach stay within your health, um, your, 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 your health, um, training, because that's ultimately what will get people to listen to you. So I would refer you to that document because I think it's just wonderful and it's based in communication science. So it's not just, just someone's idea. It's actually, um, there's lots of um, supporting citations. Great. Um, so historically, um, there's been climate change in the world. Uh, um, and the question that, um, that, is often asked that's posed is how is the climate change that we're experiencing now different than climate change that was that was experienced uh, a million years ago and um, and 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 um, and should we just resign ourselves to the fact that climate change is a reality of earth um, and and uh, that uh, migration in response to a climate change or adaptation in response to climate change is what we need to think about. I mean, it's an excellent question. I, th I think the data is, is telling us that it's, we're, this is us. You know, humanity has been around, what, 200, 300,000 years at the earliest. And the data goes back, you know, 800,000 for sure, maybe 1.2. And, you know, these ice core samples tell us exactly where the, um, parts per million of carbon dioxide were, which is really the driver of greenhouse gases. So I think if you look at that um, and understand that life and planet Earth, like I said, we'll do great, um, but it's about human health. And you know, to what degree are we gonna be able to thrive um, when all of our natural systems are going haywire and changing all around us in these ways that we've talked about? Mitigation and adaptation are absolutely part of it. So there's a sanguine view, which is like, look, the horse has left the barn. Um, we have got to tackle this. Um, I, I think we have to understand it so we can have an accurate risk assessment. We have to have shared values of accurate risk. Then we can move into policy. I always say, you know, um, people in West Virginia that worked in coal mines um, are going to need, we have to help them. Um, they're going to need help, but, and that, that's, that's where policy comes in, but don't tell me that coal is clean, right? That's where 
we're warping science and now we're all idiots, right? So I feel like um, if we understand these risks, then we can say, okay, here are the many things we can do, whether that's mitigation, adaptation, uh, investing in renewables like a moonshot, you know, Green New Deal, lots in there. There's lots of stuff that are going to uh, upset people on both sides of the aisle. But I, at the same point, I think we have to dial back and say, um, this is a problem because if we just ignore it and say, what problem, um, you know, we're going to be, uh, a lot of these things that we talked about will be closer to that 8.5 than the 2.5 and, and that's bad. I hope I answered your question. You have. Um, I, I think the, the um, you know, the, the, the un, unasked question is, is to what extent are we going to be able to control climate change uh, through various uh, mitigation efforts? So that's a great, great question. There, uh, uh, to, to some degree, yes. Um, I don't, that is not my area of expertise to, to take that deep energy policy and really play the numbers in terms of tweak this, tweak that. Um, certainly we can, we can ratchet down those curves. We can, you know, I don't want to say flatten the curve. We're all sick of that term, but um, there's evidence to say if we invest in renewables uh, sooner. Um, I, I think to me, there's a question of like what there's smart policies that are out there that can get us there quicker. Um, and, and there's data that models this. Um, so it, to me, it's absolutely part of the solution. Um, but I think the devil's in the details in terms of how much, and again, I try not to wade too hard into policy because that's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about biodiversity? Uh, tell us how climate change has affected biodiversity and what um, measures are in place to maintain biodiversity. Right. So that, 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 that's, that's certainly related, right? Biodiversity has things like ecosystem services where, you know, the environment uh, is protective for disease trans transmission. Um, we, there's been instances of, uh, you know, where monocultures, you, know, you have uh, uh, diseases that sweep through and you have proliferation of a certain species. Um, I think it was an Argentine hemorrhagic fever. That was a great case in the 60s that did this, um, where it came from um, getting rid of the native, so the native plants, planting one crop, and then a rat grew. I, I'm butchering that, but I think that's the example of that. So um, that's one example uh, of where um, you know, biodiversity really plays a role. There, there's a lot of work being done to look at um, a, a more um, conceptual sense of biodiversity, which is its nature's library. And this is our genetic heritage. And if we just trash it in, um, you know, there's a great quote that says we're burning the library before we've even read the books and these are future medicines and things like that. Um, I, I do think that the coral reefs are a great example where biodiversity ultimately supports healthy ecosystems and life. Um, and uh, when that goes away, we start to see these unintended consequences ripple through the food chain, whether it's through food security or emerging pathogens. Um, you know, I think there's a case to be made where, um, to some degree, by loss of biodiversity encroachment on natural, natural areas is putting us closer with bats and um, you know, other critters that cause these emerging pathogens to emerge. Um, it, it is a separate... Uh, there's a whole separate body of knowledge on it though, in terms of biodiversity, but it's, it's certainly interwoven into this. To your question, what's being done to preserve it? Um, the nature conservancy, there's lots of Amazon groups that are out there that are actively trying to, to preserve um, biodiversity. It, we're in an age now where it seems that natural habitats are, um, have lesser standing than, um, you know, for-profit corporations. I think one of the most intriguing things I've seen is, you know, can can a natural habitat have a corporate standing? Like, I think there's a group that wants to do this with Lake Erie. I don't pretend to know anything about this, or know enough about it, but it is intriguing to think that um, a, a natural habitat could have a legal standing to go to court against a logging company, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
Tell us, maybe finish up by telling us what, what you view as uh, the major research challenges in climate change. Um, that are that are in front of us that that uh, might uh, stimulate some of our trainees to get involved in this program. I think right now it, there, it's it, it's difficult to do research on climate change because you, there's I'll just say it it's been difficult to put climate change in a proposal and be accepted for it. Um, you know, but then there but there is a lot of work being done with extreme heat um, and uh, water uh, security preservation. Um, I think we'll see what happens in November, but I think groups like the uh, NIHS will be a major driver of, of research um, in the future on this. Um, and I defer to people that are a little bit, I'm not so much a researcher, but I know others in the audience of course are. Um, um, but I think, you know, focusing on those human impacts and correlating environmental data with hospital data is always a hot spot. We've dabbled in that with friends at National Jewish and it, they're always, um, always very impressive data. And there just isn't a lot of that. Um, another, another group of friends actually put a financial cost um, in healthcare, healthcare dollars of 12 different um, climate and health scenarios. A lot of the things that we, different things, they, they sort of did that regionally in the United States. Um, VJ LeMay was the first author on that. And that I think was one of the first papers that actually put it in dollar signs, which I think if you can mobilize um, the healthcare industry to think more about this and hospital resilience and um, patient care continuity under the threat of climate. I mean, we've seen this in New Orleans and in Houston um, uh, where hospitals and even California where hospital systems are, are themselves are under threat. But I think that could be a valuable ally in mobilizing resources to look at this closer and to advance research agenda. Mm -hmm. And, and where do you see this going in terms of curriculum development? I mean, you mentioned a number of programs, um, and but uh, tell us what, you know, if you project to project five, 10 years into the future, um, what component of medical education would this involve? Would this be a bridging program between uh, schools of medicine and schools of public health? Uh, where do you see this landing? You know, I think about the old public health challenges that are now embedded in medical school curricula, you know, um, obesity, smoking, um, and now even things like uh, you know, gun control, where these are now infiltrating the medical school curricula. Um, you know, smoking is a great example where um, there's, a, there's a smoking factoid in almost every different module, physiologic chapter or module in, in medical education. So, I sort of see this becoming one of the things that infiltrates curriculum uh, longitudinally. There is certainly fantastic opportunities for us to collaborate with the School of Public Health. Um, we tried to have a joint um, class. The truth is it was difficult from just the, the, the schedule perspective, but the, the group that teaches the School of Medicine class is really the same group that teaches the School of Public Health class. Um, so I think there's great opportunities there and cross what, what, we, what we hope is that this program, um, because it's Anschutz based and it is based at the School of Medicine, but, you know, we'll be able to tap into that uh, School of Public Health talent and as well as Boulder, because the people from Boulder have this earth science background that is phenomenally uh, enlightening. Um, so my sense to answer your question is that it'll be um, not just narrowly, uh, the curriculum won't just be narrowly uh, systems-based school of medicine, but it'll actually be more um, reflective of uh, cross-collaboration, particularly when we talk about solutions uh, to the degree that's inappropriate in, med in a medical school curriculum. And that was, I think, one of the great existential questions, right, is like, wh to what degree do we advance this, um, this conversation in traditional medical education. Um, but I think uh, there's such promise in, um, in connectivity uh, with, other, with other disciplines because this is a, uh, it's an issue that really merits many different disciplines to get, to get your hand around. It's just certainly beyond just medicine. Yep. Jay, thank you very much. This was a great discussion and I'm sure many of our trainees and some of our faculty may be getting in touch with you. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Great honor. Thank you.